Can I please request the chairman of the session, Dr. Sami Swellem, Acting Director General, Islamic Development Bank Institute, and Chief Economist at the Islamic Development Bank Group, to please join me on the stage. Can I also request the panelists to please join us on the stage, Dr. Haroon Shalek from a Senior Expert, Islamic Trade Solution Complex, Islamic Trade Finance uh, Corporation, Islamic Development Bank, to please join us on the stage. Can I also request Dr. Tarifa Alzabi, Director General, International Center for Biosaline Agricultural Agriculture from United Arab Emirates, as well as Mr. Sayed Saad Ali Pasha, Head Business Development, Islamic Chamber of Commerce, Industry and Agriculture. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala. Welcome back. I'm glad to have uh, this session with prominent uh, panelists on economic resilience and food security, integrating Islamic finance in the agricultural supply chain. Uh, I have here first Dr. Trefa Zabi, صحيح pronunciation. She is the head of the, she is the director general of the International Center for Biosaline uh, Agricultural Research. And uh, she joined the center since 2019. And in 2022, she became the director general. She has 20 years of executive and leadership experience in higher education institutions, developing services and strategies through innovation, research, and capacity development. Uh, she is as director general of the center of the biosaline uh, uh, research. She promotes sustainable food security systems and modernization of agriculture through capacity development women and youth engagement, as well as agri-preneurship. And you will explain to us what is agri-preneurship. It's a new term for me. She also presented the center research and development work at many major international conferences. We also have with us Dr. Harun Silik, senior expert, trade solutions at the International Trade Finance Corporation, a member of the Islamic Development Bank Group. After studying economics at Bilkent University and University of Virginia, Brother Harun began his career as a consultant with the Union of Chambers of Turkey. He also possessed private sector experience in Turkey where he, had, uh, we, where he held managerial positions in companies in the telecommunications and energy sector. He joined the Islamic Development Bank in 2006 and later moved to the ITFC because he wanted to make more money, I suppose, uh, and where he worked at various departments, including strategy, business, innovation, and trade finance. Brother Harun holds a PhD from Istanbul Zaim University with his thesis titled Islamic Instrument for Agricultural Finance in Turkey and a Demand Analysis. And we have Brother Sayyid Saad Ali Basha. Uh, he is manager of business development at the Islamic Chamber of Commerce, Industry and Agriculture uh, in Pakistan. Brother Sayyid is an experienced development professional from Pakistan. He is working as a business development manager at the, Chamber of, at the Islamic Chamber of Commerce. And he is managing projects related to poverty alleviation, building climate resilience, and private sector development. Brother Saad previously worked as an economic empowerment consultant with the UNDP. He supported youth vulnerable to violence and extremism and linked them with the private sector for sustainable employment and opportunities. Brother Saad's interest in understanding asymmetric relation between Global South and global north, especially in global production chains, led him to pursue the global market, local creativities, master program, focus on international development and economic history. So let me start with Dr. Tarifa, ladies first. So how would the center 
the cent uh, how would the center contribute to food security? Sure. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Again, I'm very delighted to be with you here today. Um, how the center contribute to the food security? We are a research center found in the last 20, 20, 22 years. Uh, it is hosted by the government of United Arab Emirates and the founder is Islamic Development Bank as well. So we operate in more than 40 countries around the world and we, through, we employ science to find innovative solution for food security. How can we support farmers growing in, in a such difficult time using sustainable method? As you know at the beginning that our region, as I mentioned, we work in more than 40 countries. However, if we speak also about the global challenges, climate change, it is the big thing on the agenda now. We're also talking about water scarcity. So how can we really ensure that agriculture 70% depend on water when it comes to uh, productivity? So how can we really find unconventional ways of doing uh, agriculture using saline water? Again, from our name, it's biosaline. So how can we use also groundwater? How can we really use recycled and treated wastewater when it comes to agriculture? Another element, if we are talking about climate change and we have challenges with water, what kind of crops we can grow? Again, we're looking at the conflict between Russia and Ukraine and the impact of wheat. What is the alternative? So we are also talking about alternative crops. What else people can eat and they can really contribute to their um, health and dietary system and still they can really grow it through the difficult um, and challenging time when it comes to agriculture. So, so we did are, you find alternatives? We did have alternative. alternatives. We have a gene bank that it have uh, around 20, um, um, it have 27,000 different accession of, uh, uh, of crops that are stress resilient. This is what we call them. They're crops suitable for uh, areas with uh, drought, heat, and salinity. And this is really what we are trying to promote for, to ensure that the production and the yield is being kept and do, utilized. Do farmers use these solutions? Farmers use these solutions. Uh, we do capacity development. Of course, knowledge transfer is very much important. We travel to countries, we deploy the knowledge, we share the seeds with them, and also we provide them with all those technologies that will be on the field for them to be how, able how to. How many do. farmers are using your solution? Well, so far, according to our latest statistics, we do have a, a, a we have around more than 30,000 farmers so far have deployed a number of uh, crops that we're talking about, whether that's quinoa or millet. We're talking about the complete value chain. We also established women association when it comes to crops. We have a number of them in um, Morocco and Africa, West Africa, and we're also in Central Asia. And we look at uh, youth. Uh, you've mentioned entrepreneurship. And this is very much important for us. How can we really ensure that youth will be involved in the non-conventional and traditional farming using technology? I will come to agripreneurship later, inshallah. So Brother Harun, you did your PhD exactly in food security and, uh, and the fluid supply chain. Were you able to implement these ideas in the ITFC, in the Islamic Trade Finance Corporation? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dr. Sami, first uh, I'd like to start with uh, saying when I joined IDB in 2006, it was uh, the first uh, training program. You were uh, teaching us hedging. Then I think Asian based simulation. <laughs> hedging. <laughs> then I think it helped me to shift to ITFC as a hedging. Okay. okay. <laughs> so coming back to your question, my uh, research actually followed my practice. It didn't uh, happen before I started IDB. And the reason I studied the, the agricultural finance sector was because I believed there are huge potential to implement Islamic financing in agricultural sector, which will help all Islamic financial institutions to grow much more. Because after all economic and industrial progress in the world, agriculture is still one of the most important aspects of the civilization. So today, 900 million jobs in the world in the agricultural sector. The sector is feeding 8 billion people, but despite that, 
there are 690 million people facing hunger. And despite the sustainable development goals of United Nations to have zero hunger in the world by 2030, the expected volume will increase to 890 million next seven years. And Islamic finance, from the theory to the practice, related to agriculture, from the early stage of Islam, Asr Saada, we know Salam was there, Muzara was there, Musaqat was there. But why the sector is not taking enough from this uh, Islam? So why? Why? So uh, the study is about that from both sides, supply side and the demand side. First question coming to mind, is it about the risks? Because as a practitioner, when we invest, we ask agriculture sector, is it risky? So the first question was that, and making an analysis on historical data for 15 years in Turkey, comparing the Islamic banks and the conventional banks in 12 different sectors, we came to the conclusion that no, the Islamic finance in agriculture sector is not uh, related to high risk of the sector itself. It is not uh, significantly different from other sectors. For example, manufacturing sector or tourism or real estate, they have higher MPLs, but they're getting more uh, sources from Islamic finance. So the first uh, question, is it risk? The answer in our study is no, it's not. The second question, is it about the products? Do we have enough products to provide to farmers? We compare the Islamic banks and the conventional banks, and we found the Islamic banks have all the necessary products which are provided in conventional ways by the conventional banks, available. They say the agricultural value chain from the farm to the table in seven stages. There are products available in theory and in practice to provide solutions. But again, the main problem in the Islamic finance is applying here in the agricultural sector, the debt financing versus equity financing. So we are still hesitating as the financial institutions to provide equity kind of uh, financing. We are not involved in musharaka, we are not involved in muzara'a, musaqa. But the conventional banks, they do not provide uh, they don't. musharaka. And if I understand you correctly, the contribution of Islamic banks to, to agricultural sector is less than the conventional. Is that true? And so still this question yeah. is still there. So uh, as an example, the Turkey case, the Islamic banks in Turkey, they have 7% of the credit market in whole banking sector. However, the Islamic finance and agricultural sector is only 2% even less than 2%, 1.9%. So definitely, Islamic banks are perform underperforming when it comes to agricultural sector. So the question, is it the risk? No. Is it the products? No. So what is the problem? So what's the problem? What is the problem? In my view, after analyzing, the demand side, okay, we have the supply side, there are necessary tools. But on the demand side, the farmer's side, so we conducted an analysis, doctor with 1,900 farmers in Turkey, in 37 cities. And we ask the basic questions. Are they aware of Islamic finance? Are they aware of Islamic financial products like Salem or Muzara? Do they want to work with Islamic banks? What are their priorities? The results can be summarized simply. The farmers in Turkey, I think it can be attributed to all OIC member countries. The farmers are not familiar with the Islamic finance, one thing. 60% of the farmers in our survey, they say they know nothing. They know nothing about Islamic finance. Their first priority when they decide working with a conventional bank or an Islamic bank, the first priority by 81% is the cost. Hmm. The second priority is the collateral. The third priority is the tenor. So it's nothing to do with conventional or Islamic. But when we ask those who are using Islamic finance, we had a model 
logistic regression analysis. And we found the more knowledgeable the farmer about Islamic finance, the more they use Islamic finance. So education and awareness, key. Secondly, the more compliance, perception of compliance. So if people believe that working, in, working with Islamic bank is something required from the Sharia point of view, and it is good to work with them, then they work. So very simple, but very strong message. So unless the Islamic banks, our institutions, IDB, we reach out at the ground level, the farmers, the consumers, about the Islamic finance, there is no big potential to increase it. And the third thing, in my opinion, which uh, is hindering the potential is the financial intermediary role of the Islamic banks and even ITFC. It doesn't match the necessary mindset of being an investor. Mm. So we don't want to get into complex things. So why we need to purchase a land and grow dates or banana while we can just give Murabaha credit and with the collateral. So why we have to take the difficult and complex road? So I think the potential comes from the investment companies, not the financial intermediaries or the banks. I will come to this point, inshallah, uh, later. So, Brother Sayyid, how would the Islamic Chamber of Commerce and Industry how does it contribute to food security in member countries? First of all, assalamu alaikum, uh, Excellency and all the participants here. Thank you for inviting me for such a pertinent discussion. As the panel focuses on integrating Islamic finance into the agriculture supply chain, I'll share a, share a few key statistics to put into perspective where we are right now. 36 out of the 57 or 56 OIC countries are net expo uh, importers of food. Uh, Pakistan this year was faced by a flood. 80% of the produce was destroyed. And there are estimates of $10 billion of food loss. Nigeria, 33 provinces were indebted under, uh, under floods. Couple that with the $10 billion of uh, food import bill, which is now going to rise because of the floods. 60% of the global wheat uh, exports are impacted by the russia ukrainian conflict. So putting all these things into perspective, we have to understand how they are impacting the OIC agricultural market. As one of the strategic pillars of Islamic Chamber of Commerce, Industry and Agriculture is to be an engine to mobilize investments for the private sector to support and uh, help develop it. There are two goals for the agriculture sector because of the given demographics and the focus, industrial focus of the Islamic countries. Uh, first, the Islamic Chamber of Commerce is developing projects which work across the agriculture supply chain. There is a flagship project which we are initiating in the coming month in Mauritania is the Green Waqf Initiative, which aims to redirect social financing towards sustainable agriculture. For that, we are also going to develop a digital social, a digital social financing platform to, uh, to support raising funds. Then there is another project, which is the Islamic Digital Microfinance Bank for the G5 Sahel region, Mauritania, Chad, Bukhara, Faso, Mali, and Niger. What is, is this microfinance bank already operating now or still uh, so under? We are planning a feasibility study. Islamic Development Bank is a partner for us because you approved the feasibility study grant. Okay. So, okay. Uh, when do you expect this uh, microfinance bank? What we are expecting is in the coming quarter, in the 2023, we'll give out the RFP for the feasibility study for the first pilot country, which is my uh, It should be for the... Uh, Mauritania, Morocco, which countries? Mauritania, Chad, Niger, Bukhara Faso, and Mali. These okay. are the G5 Sahel countries because of the demographics there, and they are the five most least 
developed countries in sub-Saharan Africa in the world. So starting from there would be a good model to scale up to other countries. Uh, this is the second project we, we would be focusing on. And I'm not an uh, Islamic finance expert, but what this does is the Green Walks Initiative and the bank, what it gives, it gives the potential for blended financing uh, instruments. So, a uh, land which is run on walks, you could use the Salam instrument as a forward paying, uh, paying instrument to finance the supply chain of the agriculture products. So there are potential and once we do the feasibility study, we will get to know more about the instruments which can be employed in different countries. These are two proje uh, projects which are focused on the Islamic finance or the financing instruments. Then there are two other ones. As you were asking about uh, agripreneurship uh, from Dr. Tarifa, there is a project we will initiate in Karachi with the Karachi University, the Agri Incubation Center and Mixed Farming Center. Karachi University, one of the largest public universities in Pakistan, is the strategic partner for the Islamic Chamber of Commerce, Industry and Agriculture. We have developed the project and now we are developing the training modules and what goes into... Model of what? Uh, the tra training modules for the uh, students and agripreneurs. What one thing we really focus on is urban resilience in agriculture. What we saw with COVID in Pakistan and other Muslim countries as well, that once the supply chain is disrupted uh, internationally, even in locally in countries, it's really hard to get food or food sources to the urban centers where most of the food is being consumed. So urban resilience in supply chains there in the city and urban production is something which really helps the country. One example is of the Rust Belt in USA, Detroit. What happened once the automotive industry moved out, those places were then used for agriculture purpose, urban agriculture. So this is a model which could be utilized for these high population urban centers in Muslim countries. There's this project which we are uh, planning in the coming year. So, uh, and then there is the agriculture commodities exchange market platform. We conducted a very successful workshop with Izmir Commodities Exchange in Turkey to understand what is a working model which could work for other Muslim countries for commodity exchanges. Exchange market of food? Yeah, yes, uh, commodities exchange to support small farmers because 90% of the agriculture produced in the OIC countries are small farmers with, with land more, less than 50 or f sorry, 5 hectares. So focusing on them, what this project does is, it's a rule-based system which connects the buyer to the seller without an intermediary, which can extract rent from the seller. So this really helps in the price setting. And because the platform would be a hybrid, it would be a physical platform and a digital pl platform. It this will be for all member countries or for some countries? We will start with the pilot. What uh, we gathered from uh, the workshop is Uganda, Nigeria. As, uh, the, ex as uh, the minister also mentioned, Nigeria is one of the most important countries going into the future. So is Pakistan and these high uh, population countries. We would like to focus on the ones where we could get the most benefit in the start. And Nigeria is a country with the higher population and small farm, uh, farmers, for holding farmers. It could really be a good model to replicate in other countries. Most of the projects the Islamic Chamber of Commerce aims to do is we want to replicate them. We want to have replicable models in other OIC countries. So starting with the pilot is our strategy. Okay. So these are the projects we are working across the agriculture value chain or the food security chain to develop agriculture sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Atrifa, you, uh, you are in the agripreneurship, right? So let me ask you a couple of questions. Do you, do you patent these innovations? And uh, how would you generate some revenues from these innovations? Um, to start with, uh, we are a non-for-profit center. So basically, as a research center, we are pretty much towards basic research, identifying what is really the issue and what would make the, um, um, the agriculture looks better and produce more. 
And then we have the applied research, taking what we have and take it to the field and in invite uh, our stakeholders to prototype, as um, Sayed mentioned, what we've done in order to pilot it and prototype it. So for the last 20 years, I would say the center focus was more of identifying and doing the baseline. Identifying Currently, what? Identifying the issues related to salinity challenges to, uh, in different countries, uh, water challenges, as well as the suitability of the crops. So it took us, because I mean, with, the, with agricultural research, especially if you're going to improve the resilience of crops, it takes about 10 years using the traditional research to do so. However, at the moment, we did start with the applied research, and as you rightly mentioned, we are working with the younger generation of the farmers. So we are working with the people who doesn't look at farming as just a traditional farming. They look at farming as, as a business. There is an input, there is an output, and there is a process in the middle, there is a profit need to be generated, etc. So the mind shift has changed even among the young generation in this. With this, we are deploying some of those technology with them, uh, training them, we do the knowledge transfer, and also do some customization, because as you know, one country and one region, y there is no one size fits all solution. So we've got to make sure that this is really applied for this particular region. We work with them, we identify it now, we prototype it, and then there is the shared IP between the center and sometime between the investor, and that's where we have the uh, financing organizations coming in the middle, trying to look at all those best practices or business concepts. You already that, have intellectual properties? We started that. It's part of the commercialization. It hasn't finished. We, we had two projects in, in Egypt. One is a machine for quinoa, and another one is we've done a prototype for the uh, quinoa seeds itself in Morocco. So we are moving forward. As the, again, the more challenges come, the more innovative the solution should be. And this is what we are trying more with the different entrepreneurs around the world. How many of those youngsters, how many you are working with? Um, each country, the number will vary. Uh, for example, with Africa and Celerion, uh, we do have a group of, uh, uh, I would say, 20, 20 uh, young farmers interested. Uh, I am, after this uh, conference, traveling to uh, Mozambique, and we do work with uh, women. We do have around 20 people as well. Are we women innovative? More than men. More I'm than being men. biased more now. Than men. Okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, again, uh, it, it really depends on the problem. It depends on the solution uh, provided as well. However, for every challenge, I would say there is a very innovative solution needs to be prototyped and deployed. Very good. Thank you. Brother Harun, uh, we all know that there are specialized financial institutions for various sectors of the economy. For example, there will be dedicated institutions specializing for financing agriculture, financing manufacturing, financing telecommunications, financing oil and hydrocarbons. Do we have in our member countries sufficient specialized institutions in agriculture and the food supply chain? Is this one of the weak links that we have in our economies? Yes, uh, definitely. This is one of the main reasons, especially in Islamic finance sector, the human resources. I mean, those banks which are uh, successful just name uh, uh, ABN AMRO, uh, Credit Agricole, Rabobank, Raiffeisen. So these banks are all originated from agricultural cooperatives. And they have their manpower, their systems specialized in the agricultural sector. And those banks which are relatively successful in our member countries in the agricultural sector, they have the manpower. Because when you try to finance agriculture, it's not just a balance sheet analysis. You need to know the product. You need to know the process. You need to, you need to hire uh, the engineers, agricultural engineers. So this is definitely one of the reasons. And I can tell we don't have uh, specialized institutions. But, the, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. But 
I can give an example from ITFC where we open a niche area uh, within Islamic finance for agriculture sector, which is structured trade financing. Mm. Warehouse financing by owning the commodities imported and keeping it possession under the name of ITFC, mm. taking all the risk off the goods and commodities, like a trade house, trade finance house. Mm. So we have started this in 2010, and we provided more than $3 billion under this uh, structure in different countries, in Kazakhstan, in Indonesia, in Turkey. And it became like a specialization. Mm -hmm. So we established the middle office. We had the collateral manager companies at work. So this would be an example. When you have a specialization and you identify a niche area, you can not only access more clients, but also make good income. Yeah, more, because more. the STF, the structured trade financing returns, were higher than our plain vanilla mm. uh, Murabah operations. Okay. That's a very interesting. Uh, I was planning to ask you if ITFC helped create institutions, because obviously, as you said, you will not be able to cover all the trade, you know, business, all sectors, right? So would that be something that ITFC would consider to, to establish institutions, for example, for agricultural financing, structured financing for food supply chain? Would that something ITFC might consider? Uh, Dr. Sami, maybe I need to mention about IDB group, Group's Food Security Response Program here. Because as you are aware, uh, this year in July, the board of directors of IDB approved a $10.5 billion food security response program for three and a half years until the end of 2025. And ITFC plays a significant role. We have uh, committed $4.5 billion out of $10.5 billion. And part of our commitment is uh, related to capacity building programs in agricultural sector, the flagship programs we already have, like Arab-Africa trade bridges, aid for trade for Arab countries. Now, recently, we are working on a program for CIS countries, Central Asian countries, and uh, Tajikistan, uh, CIS trade pro uh, development program. So all these flagship programs have a component of agricultural sector. Just an example. In Gambia, the groundnut is crucial for the economy and uh, for the well-being of the society. And the requirement for uh, standardization and the problem to come uh, facing the problem of aflatoxin. So ITFC partnered with the government to uh, set up the necessary the laboratories for improving the, improving the production uh, capacity. This is an example. So similar to this one, in Basically, in African countries, where the agriculture is significant, also in CIS countries. So we have uh, this kind of capacity building programs, partnering with local institutions and also the regional institutions. Very good. Very good. Uh, Brother Sayyid, uh, you are representing the Islamic Chamber of Commerce. How is your relationship with other chambers of commerce in member countries? And how would you capitalize on this to support the food security uh, issue in member countries? So most of the projects, actually all the projects I just mentioned, we operationalize, we operationalize them through our member chambers. So in Mauritania, if we are initiating the Green Works Initiative, it is the Mauritanian Chamber of Commerce which will do the stakeholder analysis for the local members who we have to work with. It was the Mauritanian Chamber of Commerce which connected us to the other ministries like the Agriculture Ministry and the Ministry of Manpower. In, if we want to initiate the Agriculture Commodities Exchange Market platform in Nigeria, it would be the Agriculture Ministry we would work with. So the importance of getting the strategic buy-in of this apex chamber is that they are our window to the private sector. They are what? Our window to the private sector there. If we cannot get commitment for these flagship projects 
from the local people, the local private sector, the investors, the government, which is the very important stakeholder when it comes to projects like Green Wax, because they are the one which, the capa which have the capacity to be legally involved in projects like these. We cannot really operationalize these projects. Even with the G5 Sahel project of the microfinancing bank, we have to have commitment from the local banks, the local financial sectors, and even the training institutes or the academia there to know what is the mechanism to get into these markets. So it is vitally important for us to work with these chambers and Islamic Chamber of Commerce uh, relationship right now is better and it's getting better each year because oh. all of these projects are approved by the Chamber of Commerce through because they are on our board of directors everything is presented to them they agree on this and then we proceed with these projects you mentioned work yeah what, what kind of work you are working on so there are two things uh, Firstly, we are trying to, through feasibility studies, trying to identify waqf land in these countries. Waqf lands? Yes, which are desolate, which are not been used, which have not been used in a while. Now, the government is the entity which have records because there are a lot of waqf entities or ministries. Like, give you an example of waqf land in Pakistan. You will only find cemeteries and cemeteries, mosques, and mausoleums on work lands. So there not, is, not agriculture, not no, farms. No. So there is a wasted potential there. So in Indonesia, it is said they, the work land, I was re reading this research paper, the work land is worth over $60 billion, but there is just one university, Bogor farm, which is over like 10 or 12 hectares and produces a revenue of two or three thousand dollars. So there is poten pot mighty potential which has been wasted. So trying to understand what is the legality of these countries to get these work desolate work plant revitalized. And there's this, there's this aspect. Then there's the aspect of redirecting social financing towards sustainable agriculture. All the OIC countries and most of the Muslim countries are very high on giving out zakat, fitra, and all these things. But if they are directed towards more sustainable activities, the impact would be higher. And there is this thing about, as a development professional, development orthodoxy is giving, giving funding and then leaving. Then there is no mechanism of understanding how and what will be the long-term impact of it. I think the next frontier in development financing and even in development is mechanisms or institutions which are locally formed where you go out of and they are self-sustaining. So Waqf is something which was there for 1200 years, then it got dormant for certain reasons, now it can start again and provide this back institutional backup for other financial, Islamic financial institute, uh, instruments like Salam and other ones which I have read about. So. Okay. Very interesting. On, on Waqf, I, I might mention that our colleagues in the uh, Islamic Development Bank Institute, they are working on an initiative on Awqaf free zones. How to develop Awqaf lands or property that are within a free zone framework. This will give protection to Awqaf properties and will help, will uh, hopefully make it systematic across different member countries. Right now, each country has its own system, its own regulations, its own uh, rules, and it becomes you know very complicated over you know centuries. But if if uh, member countries would allocate a certain region as a free zone, but that free zone will be actually dedicated for what? This can be used to produce, you know, food and energy that would be supporting member countries in the long run. Uh, Dr. Sami, I would like to add one thing. Clim uh, food security and climate resilience cannot be decoupled. A lot of forest, there is a lot of deforestation around the Muslim countries. We have the highest number of deforestation compared to any other place in the world, like one or two percent of deforestation each year. 
the economic and agriculture you mean loss. for member countries or for any specific country like in pakistan uh, like the highest to, deforestation yes, yes, it's like just one example last year there is the 2700 acre mangrove region which was converted into a housing project so you have to first decommoditify land and i think wakf is one of the only instruments which can do that or institutions which can do that so we can talk about food security we can talk about climate resilience but these two have to be in the same conversation yeah. to make a sustainable impact yeah very interesting dr atrefa do you have relationship with other agricultural research centers um, what are the most important centers that you are working on sure um if you will allow, allow me before that i would also touch base sure, on sure, the waqf sure. Uh, and the re- reason why I'm, I, I want to comment on the waqf is even we as a research center, a non-for-profit, usually we seek the waqf and we're working with the Islamic Development Bank to also develop sort of waqf in order for us to look at those innovative research and then we start deploying them for, for different countries. So we need the waqf to bring the financial sustainability for the research to make sure that it is a standing long-term contribution to other countries back to your question regarding the research center yes we definitely work for every country we have a projects where i mentioned it's uh, around 40 countries we collaborate usually with the national research center in the, each country that's our gate to collaboration either the ministry of agriculture but the national research center very much pro- pro- um, um, dominant for us because prominent for us because that's where we need the to do the knowledge transfer and we ensure that the farmers and the young people are being our um, stakeholders uh, for their own land uh, developments uh, currently we have launched a twinning program uh, where our center uh, ikba uh, twin uh, with another uh, center to make sure that we have a long term plan associated with building their human capital bringing them to our resources and facilities developing their labs and also trying to ensure that the impact is happening on the ground and there are products from this uh, collaboration um in every single country we work with the national research center so there is you no you get research grants from these uh, institutions yeah we get research grants from this institution we get research grants from islamic development bank we get research grants from international donors in order for us to make sure that the impact is already happening do you work with the university center is in in uae right the, the center Yes, the headquarter is the UAE, but we work around the world. Uh, so therefore, uh, for example, in Egypt, we make sure that we work with their uh, research, National Research Center. Now in Zimbabwe, they have the MII research, so we are already working with them. So are you working with universities on PhD, with PhD students who would work their theses on the issues you are facing there is two parts of it one is the basic research identifying the uh, the challenges and that's where we bring the researcher from the university second is the applied research finding the solution from their research as a postdoc and make sure that it's being deployed in their land or also prototype because we do have 100 hectare where we do all the uh, testing in our field to make sure that the concept is viable and re- replicable at the same time very good brother harun is the itfc innovating instruments for financing it for example you mentioned salam and muzara is the itfc planning to introduce innovative products based on these traditional uh, classical instruments actually uh, as i mentioned the structured trade financing is something putting together different modes of financing very good so it is not an issue that we don't have uh, the uh, necessary products in fiqh we have salam but who will use it to provide financing it is the islamic financial institutions so what we did is actually not to innovate a new product but to innovate new ways to use those products which is the structured trade financing having said that uh, recently we had our salam product uh, approved by idb sharia board how to implement as a guidelines uh which 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 can be identified as one of the new because so far we are 
uh, having murabaha, basically, because our institution is an international trade finance institution, so we are financing cross-border trade. And when you do that, it's mostly the buyer's credit for the importation. But with Selem, uh, the export side can be also financed. Although we provided export financing in uh, specific countries like Kazakhstan and Burkina Faso, in Burkina Faso cotton sector, we provided more than $1 billion in Burkina Faso directly to the farmers for the necessary raw materials uh, for producing cotton, and in uh, Kazakhstan also for production of wheat. Uh, but with the implementation of Selam, uh, we believe uh, the potential is uh, even higher than what we have done so far. So far as ITFC, we provided more than $10 billion of trade financing since the inception in 2008. 10 billion for? 10 billion dollars in different countries. This total, total, total trade financing. Total, no, total trade finance for agriculture. 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 Recent examples, since uh, July, we provided more than 290 million dollars for the government of Egypt for wheat importation. We are also financing the government of Uzbekistan, government of Tajikistan, in Indonesia, we provide financing for palm oil sector, which is crucial for the country. In Burkina Faso, I mentioned uh, it's not food security, but agriculture, the cotton sector, and also uh, Senelec uh, in Senegal. So these are our recent financing, all for agriculture sector. And as I mentioned, next three and a half years, our target is to provide at least $4.5 billion in agriculture sector. Sure. Brother Sayyid, you are the chamber. Uh, Brother Zwan, how, how much time we have? Eight minutes? Okay. Eight or two? Two minutes. Okay. Sayyid, have one minute. So, uh, okay, I'll come to you. Just the last one minute from Brother Sayyid. You are a chamber of industry, tra uh, trade, agriculture. agriculture. So are you bringing all those players together? Are you networking, uh, manufacturing, agriculture, and trade? I believe we are. So with the projects I mentioned and the forums, workshops we do with our international relations department, and then there is our member relations department. We try to get in contact and first explore what's been going on in the OIC countries. So we have a better understanding of what are the needs of the chambers. The chamber is a window to the private sector, so we have to understand what the private sector needs. We see that there, I'll try to wrap it up really quickly. So we see there is a surge of entrepreneurship, capital being raised in Muslim countries. Egypt being one of them, Pakistan being one of the Indonesia, Malaysia. But then there, there, were, there was a fall of a lot of startups because of operational reasons. We are trying to understand how to better become more economically resilient, and make startups more economically resilient when it comes to agriculture sector because our focus with these projects is agriculture. We have identified a few things across the value chain which needs to be looked at. But I think that's a very broad topic. We can okay. discuss that later on. So I, with your question, I think we believe we are doing our part. And we, sh we can do better, but we are doing it. Thank you. So now we have the floor, or we have to conclude? OK, let's take two questions from the floor. Yeah. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله أشوفك عبد الرحمن الشيخ من البحرين أرفع صوتك معكم عبد الرحمن الشيخ من البحرين أه سؤال الأخوة دكتور سامي سويلة من الطريفة أه الحين مثل ما تعرفون أن إحنا عندنا مشكلة في الأمن الغذائي خاصة إحنا دول الخليج دول صحراوية وعدد سكان قاعد يتزايد دول كثيرة مثل الهند حاليا قاعدة تستثمر في أفريقيا تشتري أراضي و وتأجر أراضي لحفظ أمنها الغذائي 
فاحنا في دول الخليج خاصه دول صحراويه مو هم زراعيه ايش سوينا على اساس نامن الامن الغذائي اللي عرفنا يوم الملك عبد الله الله يرحمه دخلوا السعوديه في السودان وفي اثيوبيا وشروا اراضي كبيره وصار اول حصاد للارز السعودي من افريقيا شركات مثل هاتكو كذلك في السعوديه اعتقد الامارات كذلك لها جهود في السودان واثيوبيا فشنو الجهود اللي قاعد تسوونها الاي دي بي والامارات لحفظ الامن الغذائي لدولها وشكرا اوكي ثانك يو سو ذا كويستشن از اباوت فود سكيورتي فور ذا جي سي سي اوكي وان مور كويستشن تفضل يا اي هاف ا كويستشن اند ذس از ريليتد تو فيري ماتش فود سكيورتي بت انذر انجل which is uh, you know like pakistan for example you know we had huge amount of flooding there but then uh, the debate is on that whether it was the climate change impact or it was a criminal negligence of not making dams for the last 50 years the country did not make any dams and all the water went to the ocean and then when we needed water wasn't there so don't you think that uh, their food the, the dam making of dams in islamic countries like niger Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and other African countries. Don't you think that Islamic Development Bank should also look into that? Perhaps set up some kind of special fund to make dams so that you know it can directly support the food security uh, instead of wasting the crops. Make, we can use the water to develop the crops, and that could this could be on commercial basis. You know, you can definitely generate power and then recover your investment. So how about that? I wish we can have more questions, but I think we are out of time, so we have to answer the questions. Please, if you can, because the questions have been far longer than the answers, okay. hopefully. Okay. Dr. Atref, can you answer the question on how, how to support GCC countries, mostly desert area, yeah. to uh, have food security? Sure. Um, again, we need to understand the base of the problem. The problem in the GCC is water. Water, drought, and also in addition to that is the desert. Again, our soil is not meant to be so much for agriculture. What you mentioned rightly is the two model of agriculture. One is outsourcing, taking somewhere where it has good land and good environment for agriculture and, and, and use it for agricultural purposes. The question is which what we gave us a wake up call is what happened during the pandemic. If your border closed, then you need to answer the question of the land self-sufficiency when it comes to the food production. And I think this is where we are at the moment. We are, we can always continue uh, leasing and having different uh, grounds to do agriculture, but the thing is how can we ensure we have the best practices in land? And that's, first of all, we're looking at the sources of water, we're looking at what can we do with the treated uh, wastewater, treated wastewater, Um, in GCC is not being utilized for so many reasons, hygienic reasons, uh, Islamic reasons, so many different reasons. So we need to also do research and understand how can we do and how much we can do with the treated wastewater when it comes to agriculture. Secondly, we look at the soil. We work with so many technologies for soil enhancement, looking at different models of, um, again, um, I can name examples. Uh, however, I can mention the biochar, looking at the natural-based solution to work with the ground and look at how can we really enhance the desert. Third, protected agriculture, greenhouses, vertical farming. The problem with that is the CO2 emission. And how can we really find better solution investing in having, uh, uh, again, uh, a clean energy, uh, solar power to replace all those uh, traditional greenhouses. So I think uh, the between research and investment, we will be able to get the right model where it can really help us here at the GCC countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brother Sayyid, would you like to address the Actually, second question? Uh, when you talk about building dams, you cannot dissect the Pakistan, Pakistan's political economy and what's been going on in the country for a while. So Islamic Development Bank or any other organization could come up with billions of dollars with you. But if the local political elite or any other people in power are not willing to develop the dam because of their electoral college, then that makes a very big difference. For talking about the Kalabagh Dam, it's the tobacco 
growers, which are the biggest trouble, not any linguistic problem in the region. So there is a lot of things which has to be looked at before the, these mega development projects in all the countries. So we can discuss about this later on because this is a particular interest of mine. So thank you. Hey, we'll give Harun 30 seconds to give any comment on any of the two questions. Okay. Yeah. Before we conclude. Quickly, although I am not uh, representing ISTB, I am familiar with ISTB projects. Definitely, ISTB has been providing financing for them projects. And the one came to my mind is actually in Pakistan, Mohmand uh, Dam. I think IDB signed uh, $180 million uh, financing recently for that one. And out of our food security program, uh, $5.5 billion committed by ISTB, mostly for irrigation projects, including dams. So uh, th that would be my answer uh, to the second question. Thank you. Very good. So thank you, Dr. Rifa Zabi, Brother Dr. Harun Slik, and Brother Sayyid Basha for very constructive and fruitful discussion. Thank you. Up to you, Brother Rizan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, our uh, respected panelists. Thank you very much, Dr. Sami, for conducting a very eloquently the, one of the most important sessions for this conference. And I'm sure this sets the stage for the rest of the discussions, inshallah, very well. So, Jazakumullah khair. Thank you very much, Brother Sayyid, uh, Brother Harun, Dr. Tarifa, and nevertheless, uh, Dr. Sami Swellam. Thank you very much for joining us. Maybe we can have a quick uh, picture and then, inshallah, we, we thank you for the session. Jazakumullah khair.